and welcome to Sure Sherrod's webinar. Thank you, Amy, for the music um, as we all waited. Really glad to see everyone on the call today. It means you're well enough to join us, and that's always a great way to start the webinar. Um, as we continue to shelter from home, it's a really good feeling to have all of us together as a community to share in important information, uh, allay some of our fears, get some of our questions answered. Um, and as you can imagine, today's topic of cannabis definitely draws a lot of attention, um, something that is still uh, quite unique. Um, and I just want to be completely transparent about it that it is not legal in every state and different states have different situations. So what you hear on the webinar today is for informational purposes only. Uh, please be sure to check with your healthcare professionals with your local states to see what and what is not best for you. Uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of good information that you can take to your healthcare professionals. Uh, that being said, I also wanted to share a very important message that over the last few months, many doctor's offices have not been accessible and many people have been pushing off critical doctor's appointments. We're encouraging you to speak to your healthcare professionals, visit your healthcare professionals, find out how they're keeping their offices safe for you to go to, but um, your risk for cancer or living for can with cancer is still very real and your health is important, and the healthcare and the medical community are doing the best to serve you. On the mental health side of this pandemic, the anxiety and the other issues that are related to what's going on, sure, sure it's here for you. We have a tremendous staff of skilled, trained social workers, a genetic counselor who are all ready and eager to hear from you, to help guide you, to help address the issues and concerns that you're facing every day and help it make every day a little brighter. So you can get in touch with us at www.sharsharrett.org, 866-474-2774. All our services are available online by phone, however you wanna reach us, uh, we're here for you. Um, I also wanna be clear that we don't endorse or take responsibility for any medical information you may hear today. Um, we're really very, very honored to have Dr. Sherry Yafai who is here. She's a cannabis and emergency medicine physician at Providence St. John's Medical Center. She's been there since 2009. Um, in 2017, after recreational marijuana laws had passed in California, Dr. Yafai opened her private cannabis clinic, the Re Relief Institute, where spelled L-E-A-F, um, where she sees patients primarily referred by physicians for cannabis education and treatment. She's the co-vice president of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, a member of the UCLA Cannabis Initiative, and a distinguished speaker for UCSD Center for Medical Cannabis Research, Pacific Neuroscience Institute, and multiple other medical programs. She's an adjunct associate professor at John Wayne Cancer Institute, and last year, Dr. Yafai worked with Los Angeles community to put together the first CME-approved medical cannabis conference. So if you need anyone who knows their stuff, I think that's Dr. Yafai. Also, just for Zoom etiquette, if you would like to remain anonymous, uh, you can turn off your screens, you can change your name. Um, you can also ask questions in the chat box, and we'll get to those after Dr. Yafai's presentation. This will be recorded. And just a quick thank you to our sponsors. You know, everything that we do at Share Share It is supported by, uh, by, by you and by those in our community. So a special thank you to Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund, the AZI USA Foundation, GSK, and Seattle Genetics that make this possible. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and we also have another webinar coming up on May 22nd called Shalom Shabbat, which I hope you will join us. Um, it's an opportunity to set and reset. So now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Yafai. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I am going to share screen for everybody right now. If you'll take just a moment here. All right, and we're gonna go backwards. 
or we can go backwards, just one. Okay, um, so thank you everybody for having me. I know this is such a, a lovely way to have everyone participate in this. I am going to hide um, my views. So if anybody has questions during the presentation, please feel free to um, write a little note and in the chat box and we can get to it at the end. We're gonna try and keep this brief. I know there's a lot that people have questions about and I know that's part of the best part of this these types of conversations. So without further ado, so 50 Shades of Cancer. This is gonna be a quick talk about cannabis options during and after treatment, specifically to breast cancer. A little bit of background about me. Um, I did graduate from UC San Diego Medical School. I have been working in the emergency department for the last decade after my ER residency. And over the last few years, I have transitioned quite or pivoted into cannabis-based medical practice. I still work in the ER, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how COVID-19 affects all of us during this at the very end. Um, a, quick, a quick lot of some things about all the different things I do. You can take a look at this slide, but I'm gonna highlight the things that I think would be most interesting. So Society of Cannabis Clinicians, there'll also be a little um, slide at the end of the talk about this, but this is a group that basically works entirely to educate physicians, patients, et cetera, on cannabis and what the, the medical definition of cannabis and how that can be applied to different medical situations. I write a monthly article in Emergency Medicine News to help educate emergency physicians on how cannabis is helpful or hurtful or what we're seeing in the ERs in terms of cannabis use. I'm involved in a number of different uh, research projects uh, directly on cannabis research within the medical realm. And as you'll see, the whole discussion here is going to be focused on the medical aspect of cannabis. A couple quick disclosures. I am the founder and director of my own offices called the Relief Institute. I'm the co-vice president for the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. This is a nonprofit organization similar to Charcheres. Char and I have been a paid medical educator and speaker for Canopy Growth International out of Canada. So as mentioned earlier, as of 2020, uh, if you'll wanna take a look at this map and see where you fall in terms of legalized medical marijuana or recreational use or medical use. And as we know, 11 states today have recreational laws that allow patients and individuals to walk into a dispensary anywhere they, they are um, and purchase medical marijuana free and clear. So you can purchase whatever you want if you land in one of those green states you'll see on the, on the screen here. So California, which is where we're based out of, is all recreationally and medically legal. There are 33 states in the United States that are medically legal. So you, you can get access to medical marijuana through a physician's recommendation to get medication. So what, what does this all even mean? What are we talking about? And I think defining what this means is really important when we get into these discussions because a lot of people are very confused. Hemp, weed, marijuana, pot, dope, cannabis, CBD, THC, and I think everyone can come up with at least two or three other names they've heard. All of these things are still talking about the plant, which is called cannabis sativa. Okay, so cannabis sativa L is the name of the plant itself. When we talk about the specific chemicals, that's when we're talking about CBD or THC or some of the other minor cannabinoids. Um, but a lot of people have a lot of confusion when it comes to hemp versus cannabis or marijuana. And so here's where we're gonna kind of divide these two. You can see on the screen here, there's two types of parsley. One, I, I usually do a, a question and answer here, but since we can't do that, on the left-hand side, you're gonna see a flat leaf parsley. And on the right-hand side, you're gonna see something looking like a curly hair parsley. And these two parsleys are still parsley, much like hemp and cannabis is all still cannabis, but flat-haired parsley is what you're gonna use for taste and flavor, whereas curly-haired parsley is what you're gonna use for decorative purposes. So this is similar to the hemp versus cannabis debate. Hemp is really typically what we have uh, uniformly thought of as what is curly haired parsley, whereas cannabis or marijuana was more similar to the flat haired parsley. It was what we were looking for for taste and flavor. Both of them are still cannabis. Both of them are still 
have still have amounts of THC and CBD and other cannabinoids and terpenes in them. The question becomes in how much. So we keep talking about cannabis, but what is cannabis? Cannabis is comprised of two major uh, phytocannabinoids called delta-9 tetrahydrocannabidiol or THC. And the second major one is called cannabidiol or CBD. So these two major uh, phytocannabinoids are what most plants and what most of the uh, tinctures, most of the edibles, most of all the medications you're getting, most of those are going to be comprised of one of these two or a ratio mixture of both. THC is what most people most are most well known for intoxicating activity in the brain. So what gets you high, what makes you feel good, but it's also very effective for pain management and nausea control, especially in what we're dealing with here today. Cannabidiol or CBD on the other hand is most well known for the non-intoxicating activity in the brain or most well known for things like seizure control. It's also most well known for being the active chemical in hemp, as well as nowadays in some cannabis plants. Now there's over 400 other chemicals in this plant, including other phytocannabinoids called THCA, THCV, CBDA, CBN, CBG, CBV. Those I call or lovingly refer to as the alphabet soup of cannabis. And then the terpenes, or what we think of as part of the whole plant therapy. And there's a lot of confusion where the whole plant or the whole spectrum therapy plays into all of this. Most patients who walk into my front door oftentimes say the same thing. Do I have to smoke it? Most of my patients are over 50. Most have no interest in smoking. They either don't want to, they have a fear of it, or they don't quite particularly want to intake from that perspective. And you can, you can use it in lots of different ways. Besides inhalation, you can use it in ingestible forms such as oils, sublingual sprays, honey, tea, edibles, brownies, cookies, chocolate. You can use hard candies, gummy bears, gel capsules. There's even topicals. This is, I think, one of the most underutilized forms of cannabis. So topicals such as pomades or creams can be very frequently useful for um, post-radiation treatment, muscular pain, back pain. Intravaginal suppositories, we have patients who are using this specifically after um, or for treatment of cervical cancer, uterine cancer, uh, or rectal cancers with rectal suppositories. You can use sublingual melts. These are very similar to the Zofran tablets that patients use for uh, nausea treatment in cancer. You can take them via G-tube. We have a subgroup of patients who have G-tube only and you can administer these through G-tube as well. And lastly, for some of my very, very atypical patients who have a hard time using any of the above, we can use them in forms like a bath bomb, and those can be very soothing as well. Now, I wanna show you just some pictures of what this looks like. Uh, you're gonna see that first picture is a picture of an actual cannabis plant. The second picture is a very uh, well-known uh, tincture based off of Charlotte's Web or Charlotte's, uh, Charlotte Figgy was a young girl with severe seizure disorders that uh, you started using this very particular plant to use for seizure control and did very well up until recently. Unfortunately, she passed away during COVID, due to COVID-19. This is what a vape pen can look like. So it's a very small, almost cigarette size and very easy to use. You push a button and you can take an inhalation. There's very little in terms of smoke or um, smell. This is what's referred to as wax. This is a chocolate bar here. This is a very common popular chocolate bar here in California. Previously, you could get things like chronic toast crunch or fruity loopies, cat and munch, and this has now been banned here in the state of California as well as some of the other states because we've seen children overdose due to um, edibles that look like regular kids' foods. Foria is a really lovely brand that has brought to light uh, vaginal topical use for women and for specifically for sexual pleasure. And then you're gonna see things off the shelf these days at CVS, such as diaper cream with hemp-based CBD. So there's a lot of different 
uh, options on the market. In fact, there's over 50,000 different products in the state of California alone. And now we're starting to see hemp-based products since January of 2019 when FDA ruled that you can sell CBD across the United States free and clear and it didn't have any problems that you could sell hemp CBD and it's now being sold in CVS, it, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. They were running a special uh, a couple months ago. So one of the things that I'm proud to bring to the forefront here is a new product that's available, which are kosher products. And we're gonna start seeing this kind of bloom and blossom. Mitzvah Wellness is a group I work with and they're lovely and they create lovely, wonderful, soothing products here in Los Angeles. And they deliver, I believe, all over. This is the first CBD company to be certified kosher by the OU. It is a hemp-based CBD only, topical as well as oils. Currently, the Orthodox Union does not certify THC products, but they are working closely with Mitzvah, and that could change in the near future. If you do want to reach out to them, the, their email and phone number is on this screen, and I can share it with everyone later as well. So this is for a little comedic break. No, I won't prescribe medical marijuana for you because the people who make it won't fly me to the Caribbean for conferences. So this is really a, a very... Um, a very sad perspective sometimes on the medical world and industry because most patients think that, you know, we as physicians won't recommend this because we're not being paid by the pharmaceutical companies. That's not the truth of the matter. That is far from it. Most physicians just are not well educated on this because we're not taught nearly enough about it as this is a really new type of medication. So in general, you do need a physician's recommendation in 33 states where medical marijuana is strictly medical, you do need a recommendation. It is not a prescription unless you get one of two products. Marinol is one of the prescription pharmaceutical versions, which is a THC synthetic pill. It's been around since 1986 and was designed for cancer related nausea and vomiting. There's also now Epidiolex, which is a CBD based plant pill. Um, sorry, not a pill, it's actually an oil tincture, and that is both DEA and FDA approved since 2018, specifically for kids with a severe form of seizure disorder that causes seizures, oh, about 200 times a day. So outside of those, um, you do need, so here in California, for example, in states where it is, uh, it is, oh, the word is escaping me, it is recreationally legal, you do not need a recommendation. You can walk into any store, any dispensary, you can walk into Bed Bath & Beyond, CVS, and purchase whatever you want in any quantity that you want. The difference comes here in the state of California for patients such as yourselves is when you're taking other medications, you don't know what dose to take. You want it for a very specific reason. You're not using it just to get high or stoned. Most patients find that they need a little bit more advice and guidance, much like you would if you said, I have pain and I told you, hey, you could take Norco, Percocet, fentanyl, morphine, Tylenol, Motrin, anything you want in any quantity that you want and you figure it out for yourself. Most people feel fairly uncomfortable with that, which is why I recommend and suggest strongly that patients do come and seek medical advice, at least for the first you know, one to two times to get a hang of how to use this, these different products. So I wanted to give you guys a few case presentations here about what can, where we can see cannabis being used really well for our cancer patients. So the first case. So patient walks in with a new diagnosis of cancer. Patients are oftentimes filled with anxiety when they get first diagnosed and commonly as a result, a little bit of insomnia. Thoughts of alternate paths to cure cancer do come up with any you know, easy web search, you will see a hundred different ads coming at you. Um, a lot of patients will also seek other recommendations and you're also gonna see in those times, hey, I cured my cancer with cannabis. Chemo, radiation, surgery, multiple doctor's appointments, all of these things can be very overwhelming to patients and using something that can help with multiple different pathway points, so anxiety, insomnia, um, pain, nausea, all of these different things, if you can help with one treatment strategy, it really seems to be a really nice alternative. 
part two to this is oftentimes patients will walk in after they've already gone to a dispensary and they, the bud tender, which is what we call lovingly the person behind the counter who's dispensing these medications, the bud tender will advise them to take, you know, uh, tincture A and a little bit of tincture B and also edible C and, oh, they should also use X, Y, and Z. And it becomes one very costly to patients as these tinctures can run anywhere from 70 to $150. Number two, it can become very overwhelming as patients don't know when to take what, how to take them. And quite frankly, the bud tender behind the counter can be somebody who is well-versed in these things, or it could be a 20-year-old who, you know, quite frankly, likes to use cannabis products on their own time. And so it becomes really difficult to understand what you're using and for what purpose you're using. So these are all different things that we can we can address when you come in and where cannabis, be it THC, be it CBD, be it a combination of these two can really be helpful. Case number two, in the middle of cancer treatment, again, you're gonna find individuals who are filled with anxiety. Again, insomnia is a common, uh, common end pathway for a lot of this anxiety to, and turmoil to come to a head. Thoughts of alternate pathways, again, to cure cancer, chemo, radiation, surgery. You're going to see a lot of these similar issues coming up that are overwhelming. I've had patients with cold cap usage um, to help prevent hair loss, and now they're getting headaches, and that's becoming problematic as well. Now nausea, vomiting, and anxiety, uh, sorry, nausea, vomiting, and poor appetite are starting to kick in as chemo treatments are underway. Constipation from opiates and uh, poor pain management become problematic as well. Not everybody likes taking opiates. Not everybody uh, responds well to taking opiates. So these, again, are places where we can use cannabis-based products to offset some of the needs. It's been really amazing to see some of the research coming out showing us that you can use, you know, a, for example, a little bit of THC-based products and use half as much opiates and get the same amount of pain control and pain management. So being able to modify or adjust some of your pain management in terms of what medications you're using. Part three, post-cancer treatment. And we're seeing more and more patients survive cancer. And this is a wonderful situation. But what we're not seeing a lot of is, you know, treatment after the fact. So anxiety is less pervasive, but you're still scared. You're scared because oh my God, I have um, a little bump on my leg. I have a little lump under my arm. What am I thinking of? The first thing my thoughts go to are cancer. And I worry that every time I catch a cold, I worry about every time I you know, get a little mild illness that it's going back to cancer again. I have a lot of patients who have residual pain and tightness in the pectoral area after having had surgery and radiation. So can we use a topical in those areas? as a simple means to help with physical therapy, as a simple means to deal with pain, as opposed to using another narcotic, which may or may not be working so well. Uh, very often we're seeing peripheral neuropathy or tingling in the, in, in the tips of your fingers and the tips of your toes. That's something where we're seeing cannabis, specifically THC, within the terms of research coming to a head as a really good line of treatment. And most patients don't want to be dependent on opiates. They don't want to be dependent on Ativan or hypnosedatives like Ambien, uh, Sonata, et cetera, to get, to get to a point where they're tired of taking these medications and they want to be able to come off of these medications and have a hard time doing that. So can we use cannabis? And again, in, that, in those terms, sometimes it's going to be THC, sometimes it's going to be CBD, depending on what the purposes are and where you are in terms of pain management. Lastly, as life goes on after cancer treatment, we do see chronic pain in both in patients after cancer treatment, prior to cancer treatment, and now we have a heavy amount of opiate use, gabapentin, benzodiazepines, and hypnosedatives. And can we slowly try and get patients off of these medications? Can we add to it? without adding to their opiate burden, and how we can do this in terms of a balance and a fair balance for patients. So um, to lighten up the mood a little bit, okay docs, step away from the mildly psychoactive weed or lose your license to prescribe highly addictive and sometimes deadly opioids. 
and this is a medical marijuana dispensary. So we have to take into consideration sometimes that cannabis, while it's been thought to be very bad for you for a lot of years, is not even close to opiates. And we know that we've seen a lot of research come out in these terms, and maybe we can find a better place for both of these, you know, I always say there's a good place for opiates and there's a good place for cannabis. And we, we need to find a, a nice balance between these two in terms of usage. So very quickly, in terms of side effects, everything comes at a cost. Um, THC and CBD are no different. We do have to be careful when um, using THC for patients who are driving. Some of this patients will adjust to, similar to opiates and benzodiazepines, some people won't. THC can cause a drop in blood pressure and cause some lightheadedness as well as changes in heart rate, especially um, patients who have a predisposition to, um, to changes in their heart rate. Sleepiness, we can use that to our advantage in terms of insomnia, so using the side effect profile for benefit profile. You can get some dry mouth and dry eyes. The, the best part about this is it is not a risk for lung cancer. This has been studied by UCLA and Dr. Donald Tashkin in the early 2000s. The risk for overdose is low, but the benefit of it is, is that the overdose is not lethal. In fact, most of the time what happens is one of two things, either you will become anxious and paranoid or you'll just go to sleep. And both of those, again, the downside is, is that it's not deadly like opiates. Um, there is a uh, risk for addiction. It is 9%, unlike opiates, which are roughly around 18 to 20%. Euphoria. Oftentimes we discuss in the medical world as euphoria as being a bad thing. In fact, in our cancer patients, this is something that we're not discussing enough of. We need, you know, way too often are we prescribing antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications after you've already reached a downward spiral. We need to be getting ahead of this and we need to be treating patients with something that makes people feel good. It is a good side effect, not a bad one. And recreational misuse, it's not something we're necessarily talking about in this conversation, but in teenagers, it's definitely a conversation that needs to be had. Some quick contraindications. CBD actually for patients with transplant is contraindicated unless you're being very closely watched with um, blood tests. With seizure medications, you also need to be carefully monitored with um, blood tests as well. Pulmonary problems for those who are smoking, patients with previous allergic reactions. For THC, patients who are on narcotics, benzodiazepines, and other sedatives, again, it needs to be more closely evaluated and monitored. Schizophrenia in, in the general past has been a strict contraindication with THC. And then bipolar disorder, this can be somewhat challenging. All right, um, my time, I don't wanna take up too much of my time so that we don't get to questions, but COVID-19, does it, how does it relate, does it relate? We're seeing an increase in usage during coronavirus across the United States, as this is a treatment for anxiety and stress, as well as a way to unwind, uh, an, a different option to alcohol usage, which also tends to go up in times of stressors. If you are symptomatic with any coronavirus-like um, symptoms such as shortness of breath, fevers, I do ask that you stop using anything that is inhaled and seek guidance from your physician. Consider using alternatives to smoking and during these times such as oils and edibles. Those need to be a little bit more closely monitored because the dosage can matter. Cannabis tends to be a very social usage of a product and as such most people tend to share vapes, bongs, pens, etc. Please do not share during these times as it is what you're transmitting coronavirus and because patients can be asymptomatic during corona, we're asking that you do your due diligence and purchase your own products and not share any of these products. Coronavirus does have some conflicting research in terms of cannabinoids. There are some studies that are coming out that are touting this as an antiviral and an antibacterial properties but there are some that are also saying that um, the pulmonary effects are unknown. So as of right now, we really have to walk a fine line because we just are not very clear on what the final say is going to be. And as always, please use good judgment when, when reading these studies. 
Okay, really quickly, just a quick look at Society of Cannabis Clinicians. This is a good outlet for medical education. If you have questions, there is a library that I believe is free to everybody online. You can go to cannabisclinicians.org and find um, any research that you're looking for. If you wanna join, it is, um, I believe it's 100 or $150 to join for the year. And this goes <laughs> entirely towards medical education. There is a quarterly meeting for members where we um, discuss pertinent topics of the day and recent research. Um, we've had great clinicians come talk to us from Spain about breast cancer treatment and CBD and THC and where they are in terms of that, which was really lovely. Um, that was with Dr. Christina Sanchez just within the last year alone. All right. Thank you to Shao Sherrod for having me here today. I know this has been a little bit different from our usual way we, we share information, but I'm so happy that we could do this today for 125 people. And if you'd like to reach out to me, please feel free to reach out by phone or email. Email is probably the easiest these days. We are doing telephone consultations only right now and happy to answer questions at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Yefai. Clearly you have made an impression because I can't tell you I'm getting questions from all over the place. Any way people can reach us, email, text. So I'm gonna to try to put them all together, mindful of everyone's time, but really thank you, helping to clarify, adding a little bit of humor and connecting it to what we're going through right now. So there is a couple, there are a few questions related to neuropathy. Can you talk a little bit more about neuropathy and, and that issue? Great question. So neuropathy, especially peripheral neuropathy. So we see mostly with cancer patients, especially breast cancer treatment is peripheral neuropathy. So the fingers and the toes most commonly, as opposed to sciatica, which also does pop up where you get low back pain that radiates down the side of your leg. UCSD has done a number of different peripheral neuropathy studies. So much in fact that California state recommendation through the Medical Board of California now includes cannabis as an equal option to gabapentin, for example, for first line treatment. So THC very specifically in a very low dose can be useful for some patients with peripheral neuropathy. This can be smoked, it can be used as an oil tincture or an edible. And the goal is really, 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 really small dosages of THC can go a long way. That being said, um, topical use of THC as well as capsaicin, it's also another nice alternative, can be used on the fingertips and the toes. It goes 50-50. I see some patients get additional burning from topical use of THC for peripheral neuropathy, and some patients love it, and that's all they need to use at all. Thank you. There are a lot of questions about getting referrals, uh, medical marijuana cards, avoiding high taxes. Can you give some right. information on why a doctor would or would not give those, and how do you get one, and... Okay. All right. So here's here's kind of the, the levels. So here in California, you can walk into a store and purchase anything you want. If you want to avoid taxes, and um, you can always ask your medical doctor or even naturopaths provide this, nurses provide this. There's a variety of other people who will also provide these medical recommendations. One way that you can get it, if you don't know a clinician who will provide this to you, you can go on cannabisclinicians.org. So that's the Society of Cannabis Clinicians website. There is find a clinician directory on there and you can literally put in your zip code and find a clinician nearby you who will provide you with that recommendation. If um, money is an issue and you're not interested in getting a full kind of discussion about it, I believe there's tons of online, you know, uh, pseudo clinicians or clinicians that will give you like a $40 recommendation form. <clears throat> so they will, the advantage to doing that is, for example, here in California, you'll get about a 15 to 20% discount on taxes to make those purchases. Um, you can also go to the Department of Public Health. So I can always point you to where you can go and the Department of Public Health, you should get, I believe closer to almost a 0% tax. Um, but that also requires an additional 50 to to $100, depending on um, what you can afford to get that specific card to, to hand over to the dispensaries. Some dispensaries will even provide you with an additional cancer 
discount. So if you provide them just a statement from your physician that says, I have cancer, they'll give you an additional discount on um, what you can get. Thank you. There are a lot of questions about dispensaries, what distinguishes one from another, and also related to that is if you could talk a little bit about the difference between the standardized forms of medical marijuana and the more tailored formulations that are available in well-respected dispensaries. Should people be going to find those? How do you know where, which ones are reliable? How, are there grades? How does it work? So I would start with a dispensary that has a license. That's kind of step one, because if they have a license, then they're only allowed to put on their shelves licensed products, which means that they've gone through at least a battery of testing that verifies what's in the bottle, because that was a problem we were having prior to recreational legalization was they might put you know, 300 milligrams on the bottle, but what was actually in the bottle was unclear. So the very first step is to make sure that your dispensary is licensed. Part two, and the way you can find that out, I believe weedmaps.com. Um, again, I apologize, but most of my information is here, here for the state of California. Weedmaps.com is national, but for here in the state of California, they will only put up uh, licensed dispensaries on their website. Part two is once you've got a licensed dispensary, you can guarantee that whatever products you purchase, at least what's in the product and what's on the label is confirmed. The next step is to figure out what's best for you. And that's basically what I do with um, consultations. If you, if you want to just kind of start on your own, I would recommend starting. Smoking is probably the easiest for patients to self-start because you can't overdo it. It's really hard to overdo smoking as opposed to a tincture where people don't know how much they're actually taking and it takes about an hour to two hours to start taking effect similar to edibles where it takes about an hour to two hours to take effect, um, sometimes even three hours. And so you take something, you don't even know if it's working or not. On the other hand, if you smoke something, that takes about one minute to five minutes to take effect. So you really know very quickly what's gonna work for you. Um, for all patients, I would start at a very, you can ask, the people behind the counter are very knowledgeable about what's actually in the flower because those have to be written down. So I would start with the lowest possible THC in a smokable form. And those are still going to be the most helpful in terms of nausea and vomiting in cancer patients. Uh, there's a question if CBT THC is a CYP3A4 inhibitor and it can interfere with cancer drugs like Ibrams. And if you could talk also a little bit about um, cannabis and metastatic breast cancer. Good question. So these are getting into a lot of the details. So yes, CBD and THC both inhibit one of the specific liver enzymes, which is why it's contraindicated in transplant patients because they do interact very specifically. CBD interacts on a higher level with those liver enzymes. THC, on the other hand, does not interact as, as aggressively as CBD does. So it's one of those small differences, but really important differences. Again, which is why if you want to kind of play around with something on your own, I sometimes recommend playing around with a smokable THC because it's less likely going to interact with your other medications. Unless, of course, you have antidepressants, um, narcotics, hypnosedatives, or benzodiazepines on board. Um, again, for metastatic cancer, what we're getting into the nitty gritties of, and this is hard to do with each individual patient, but the question becomes, what are you trying to treat? And so I try to avoid telling people, oh, just go try X, Y, and Z, because everybody's trying to treat something different. It would be like me saying to you, oh, you should just take two Tylenols or two aspirins and call me in the morning. It doesn't work so much anymore because we know so much more details about A, what we're trying to treat, and B, what works best for you. And so that's really where we're gonna try and get into the nitty gritties with consultations, sorry. And is it effective if you're already on something like morphine? Yes. So morphine has its limitations, and that's why some patients find they have to take more and more morphine. I've had, uh, so pancreatic cancer patients very specifically don't do great with morphine. They do really well with THC and CBD. Breast cancer patients, some patients do okay with morphine. Some don't, and they like THC, CBD. It really ends up being your specific um, what works specifically for you. This, this is probably the most personalized medication I've ever worked with in my entire life. 
Do tinctures or other liquids go bad? Do they need to be refrigerated, especially if you're putting something like a dropper in your mouth? They tend, uh, we don't, I shouldn't say this. I don't know what the lifespan is, is for your tincture. Tinctures in general are mixed with oil. So when you put them in the refrigerator, they get, they get hardened. Um, so it's very difficult to take. So I don't recommend putting tinctures in the refrigerator. Edibles on the other hand, like chocolates, I do have people put in the refrigerator. If you need to cut a gel capsule, you can put that in the freezer to cut that in half, but then you have to put the other half immediately back in the freezer so it doesn't melt out. Or maybe I missed it. Um, does insurance ever cover any of this? Good question. So insurance does cover about 50% of my visit, so I can provide patients with a super bill and they, um, they apply that back to their insurance. Um, Medicare does cover roughly 50%. Other insurances cover anywhere from a quarter to 50%. Medications are not covered at all by any insurance, unless you get Marinol or Epidiolex. Um, talking about contraindication, uh, someone's asking if they're on blood thinners and beta blockers. Um, is there an issue with CBD oil, with these drugs? Yeah, so with beta blockers, the question becomes why you're taking it. It's, if it's because you have a history of a tachyarrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation, you have to be very careful with THC. You can use it, but you need to be under strict guidance. With CBD, um, for beta blockers, it's not an issue. For blood thinners, it is a questionable research-based um, uh, questionable research-based contraindication, but to date, we haven't had any issues. But again, that's something that you need to be in close contact with your healthcare provider, especially if you need to get your INR rechecked. And does it affect your platelets, hemoglobin, any of that, your blood counts? It doesn't seem to be. It seems to be theoretic at this point at dosages that are more common. Oh, you're muted. Yes, I am, just checking. Oh. Um, also, just wanted to go back in the beginning, you talked about smoking and vaping. Um, are, is it dangerous? What's the safety about those versus ingesting? Right. So, so remember, cannabis, the plant, has been around for hundreds of years. And the most common form of using this plant for hundreds of years has been smoking. So most people, most of my patients aren't comfortable smoking, which is just fine, but that's probably still the safest way to use um, bar none than ingesting products. Now ingesting products is still very safe. The challenge becomes dosing it. And that's really where it becomes a little bit more tricky. And is the quality of cannabis from a U.S. dispensary, how does it compare to the quality from a Canadian dispensary? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay. I have not been to Canada yet during all of this. Oh, I see a vertigo question pop up. I have found that vertigo gets exasperated with um, cannabis, so I would not use anything. Okay, we have a few more minutes, but I also want to tell people you can continue to send questions to us through Sharsharet. Um, I know there were a lot of questions about kosher products, and you put that up oh, on yeah. the slides, and we have we will have these slides on our website. All, this this webinar is being recorded and will be saved and on sharsharet.org, where we have all of our pro programs, all of our virtual programs will are saved, and you can access them um, at any other time. Uh, we probably have another minute or two for questions, so let me see what I can get to. Um, we pretty much covered everything. Um, and just back to anxiety, because I know that we're living in a time when things are so uncertain. Um, what is the most of what they're recommending for anxiety? If someone's ant on antidepressants are limited because uh, they interact with her tamoxifen. So what kind of this are they recommending for anxiety? I would consider, if you're not going to seek the care of a clinician, I would consider starting with a CBD-based medication. Um, but you have to be very careful with those because they can interact together. Okay. And we talked a lot about insomnia and sleep. Um, 
what and same thing with that is there any specific type of cannabis that should be for specifically for sleep so with insomnia and sleep if pain and anxiety are not an issue you can start with again generalizing this it would be a thc base that you'd want to start with if someone is going into hospice um would they be offering cbt do you have to ask for that up front you would have to ask and the clinician would have to feel comfortable or again, I'm readily available to help for those patients. Okay, and then I think you may have mentioned um, where people can purchase cannabis legally. Is that something they could find in your slides or? Um, uh, I, I'm gonna type it into the um, conversation, weedmaps.com, oh, not private. Um, and then uh, somebody just asked about safety for travel. Um, so you can travel with hemp-based CBD products uh, by the FDA rules as well as the TSA rules as of this past, I think it was exactly a year ago. Oh my goodness, it's been a while. Um, TSA allows you to travel with hemp CBD products legally now uh, across all 50 United States. This does not um, get extended to international travel and it is strictly including hemp CBD only. Okay, so I wanna wrap this up. There are still a lot of questions coming in that we will share with Dr. Yafai and hopefully uh, she'll get us that and, and we'll get you the answers you need um, in the next day or so. Additionally, if you know others who wanted to participate today, tell them not to worry. They can, not, no anxiety here. They can come <laughs> access uh, this webinar at any time. It will be up in the next few hours, if not the next day, along with others. I encourage you to check out those as well. A really huge thank you, Dr. Yafai, for giving us your time. We know this is a very busy time for healthcare workers, certainly those in emergency medicine. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time for the women and families of Sharsharet. Again, um, this was not a medical webinar. We encourage you to speak directly. This is for informational purposes only. Speak directly with your healthcare professional. Do not take any advice in place of any kind of medical treatment you are doing. Um, and also check with your state about legislation. Uh, really appreciate your time. And if anyone would like to speak directly with a shared social worker or genetic counselor, uh, everything that we do is free and accessible to you to reach us by phone 866-474-2774 or by uh, on our website www.sharsharet.org. Um, I'm Alana Silver, by the way, the Executive Director of Sharsharet, and I look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar, which will be um, Shalom Shabbat on the 22nd. So stay well, um, stay home, um, and speak to your doctors if you need anything. And thank you for joining us.